Hello and welcome to Pharma Television News Review here in Munich at Bio Europe 2010. On this show, I have Luke Doshe, who is the Chief Business Officer at a company called Prosenza, which is based in Leiden in the Netherlands. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, Luke, uh, Prosenza is a, a company, is a very specialist company. It has its own unique uh, underlying technology that can be applied to specific types of diseases. Could you tell us a little bit about the underlying technology? Sure. Um, we are focused on uh, RNA modulation, so it's a company using antisense oligonucleotides to work at the RNA level. So it is not gene therapy, it is genetic therapy, but we try to correct something that went wrong at the DNA level, at the RNA level, to then have the positive effects that we want to have downstream at the protein level. Uh, one example of that is, for example, exon skipping in which we apply in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is our uh, lead therapeutic indication. And in the case of axon skipping, by skipping an axon, you try to convert an out-of-frame mutation into an in-frame mutation, which then leads to a shorter but still functional protein. So this particular technology particularly lends itself to Duchenne muscular dystrophy because of the nature of that particular disease. Uh, axon skipping is one application of RNA modulation and axon skipping indeed is perfectly suited for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy but also has potential other applications in other genetic diseases. Uh, but like said we have uh, developed it as far as possible today with the Duchenne application indeed. So let's just see, look back at the origins of the company itself. So when was the, when the company was originally um, incorporated? The company was founded in uh, 2002 by uh, three entrepreneurs who wanted to do something with RNA therapy, you know, but quite quickly got in contact with Professor Gert-Jan Vermeulen, who is a, uh, you know, professor in human genetics, a quite known professor in human genetics at Leiden University Medical Center, who was thinking about applications of axon skipping, and that quickly became the lead focus of the company in, uh, as of 2002-2003. And um, it is backed by venture capital? Ultimately, yes. Uh, so the initial funding came from the entrepreneurs, but also a lot from the patient advocacy groups and the uh, patient organizations. So the, although the company was incorporated in 2002, the first Series A financing only took place in 2007 when uh, LSP, Life Science Partners out of Holland, and Abingworth out of the UK kind of uh, started to really back the company with some serious venture capital. Now let's just shift a little bit to the actual clinical program or the, the, the underlying technology and how it's applied specifically to the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So could you tell us how, what is, what's the strategy has been in, in particular in, in selecting the various approaches that you can take to that because patients have this variance. So first, a little bit about Duchenne maybe. Duchenne yes. muscular dystrophy is caused by the lack of a certain protein called the dystrophin protein, which acts as kind of a shock absorber between uh, muscle cells. So obviously if you don't have a shock absorber, if you can't, you know, make it continuously, it uh, leads to a deterioration of the muscle cell and, and obviously the muscles you use most get damaged first. So these, is, uh, these boys uh, first end up in a wheelchair, so they start having walking problems when they're five, six, seven years old. When they're in their teens they end up in a wheelchair, when they're, you know, in their late teens they can't use their arms anymore and then when they're in the twenties they need to get onto ventilation, they start to have heart problems and, and ultimately, you know, life expectation is around and, and 20, 30 year olds. So it's a very disabilitating and, and very you know, bad disease, not only for the patients, but also for the caretakers, as you see your, your healthy kid kind of deteriorate over time into somebody who is still in a good state of mind, but can't use his muscles anymore, who's kind of trapped into, into his own body and has a lot of limitations. So this lack of dystrophin is caused by a mutation in the dystrophin gene. The dystrophin gene is uh, one of the largest gene in the, or is the single largest gene in the human body and has 79 axons. You can imagine that then sometimes in the process something goes wrong and that some of these axons are missing. So the deletion of some of these axons leads to a out of frame which then leads to a non-production of dystrophin and, and that causes all the problems that I just described. Clearly then each patient can be different and therefore uh, the, the application of your technology or the, the use of that uh, therapeutic approach 
vary, can vary from patient to patient. Uh, absolutely, I think this is personalized medicine in almost its its purest Origin. form and or in its ultimate form indeed. So because of, of depending on, on the, the lesion and the accents that the patient miss, we kind of skip an accent to kind of correct the reading frame and to convert it into an in-frame mutation. So obviously you need many, many accent skippers, as we call them, to treat all patients. Obviously and luckily enough there is some clustering around it and, and so you have bigger groups of patients that can be helped by the same axon skipper and this is you know our lead product which is called Pro 51 or now GSK 968 thanks to a partnering deal that we did last year with uh, GlaxoSmithKline is, is targeting about 13% of all possible Duchenne boys so there is there are some hotspots there so you have some some bigger indicate or bigger subpopulations than others. So tell us about the actual clinical development program and there must have been challenges to try and get a product which is quite novel um, into the clinic. Tell us how you've overcome those, those challenges and where you are now in your clinical development program. No, absolutely. We did a lot of work first, you know, preclinically in vivo with patient cells and, and you know, uh, certainly in collaboration with the Leiden University Medical Center where this research actually originated already in, in 2000. So after a long period in 2007, we were ready to move into the clinic and we did a, a safety study. One can understand that this cannot be done in healthy volunteers, so you directly have to go into patients. So it took a little bit of convincing to the regulatory authorities and to the ethical committees, but all with all, you know, that went that went pretty fast. We did it actually in two steps. Uh, first step was an intramuscular injection. So uh, injected directly into the muscle of the boys, uh, four boys, and then after a month we took a small muscle, muscle biopsy to see if we could restore dystrophin, if you could see dystrophin in that, in that biopsy. And that was positive, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be talking about this at, at this stage, um, which was a, a big breakthrough and that led to the uh, financing by the uh, venture capitalist Abingworth and LSP. Next challenge obviously was to move into a systemic delivery as that has been been a, a big challenge for antisense oligonucleotides in the, uh, in the past. And so we did a subcutaneous injection in uh, 12 boys, uh, five weekly injections in a dose escalating manner, and then uh, we took biopsies at the end of that period. So uh, a couple of weeks after the last injection, we took again muscle biopsies. Uh, so the injection was in the abdominal region and the muscle biopsies were taken at the tibialis anterior, so at a quite you know, distant this location. Is and you know we saw a very nice uh, nice data uh, coming out of that study so we saw a uh, dose response and we saw dystrophin expression in all 12 boys that we had treated with the drug so systemic delivery of an antisense oligo could do the job was was kind of the key message there which led to a lot of interest from investors but also from uh, big pharma companies and other companies that are interested in these uh, orphans to deliver something systemically or particularly in rna yeah. Uh, to to uh, systemically, what sort of formulation do you have to come up with a formulation for that presumably or no? This is I think the one time I can say that uh, you know we were lucky quote unquote lucky with the disease because because of the Duchenne disease muscle cells are more leaky because of the lack of dystrophin you know they get damaged and they get bigger pores than normal cells and that apparently leads to a better uptake of large molecules such as antisense oligonucleotides so here there was a fit of the disease with the therapy that we had developed so it's it's no special formulation and it's obviously something that is only specifically applicable to Duchenne but once more a proof that axon skipping is something with antisense oligos is something that was quote unquote made for Duchenne Right. So um, clearly then you've, you, this attracted, as you said, the interest of both venture capitalists but also of major pharmaceutical companies that led to your, your collaboration and partnership with, with, with GlaxoSmithKline. T tell us about that, that particular collaboration and, and, uh, and what's left for you guys to take forward yourselves. No, absolutely. So the deal uh, is a combination of a license and an option deal. So Glaxo took a license on the lead compound and is now responsible for further development and commercialization. This being said, we still play an active role, uh, you know, but more in the back of the car instead of, you know, driving the car. Uh, 
which is good because we can leverage our knowledge that we have about the Duchenne space and about Antisense Oligos to Lexo. We can tap into their development expertise, which we can then learn from for the development of other accents that we have retained for ourselves. The option component means that they have options on three additional axon skippers. But this being said, there are still many other, many other accent skippers that are left for ourselves that we will try to bring to patients ourselves. And, and that is definitely the ambition of the company to build a fully integrated specialty biopharma company. And, uh, like and following the business model of the biomarins and the genzymes uh, that, that have proven that this is possible. But with the deal, we try to kind of combine, uh, get to, I would say, diminish or to minimize the first development risk or to share that with an experienced partner and still cap, keep a little bit of the, of the upside that is out there and the potential that is out there for ourselves. With GSK taking the clinical development program forward, where are they now and what are the, what's the next important piece of uh, research that's going to take place? Yeah. Also, as you can imagine, uh, that I have to follow a little bit uh, GlaxoSmithKline's policies about communicating about uh, the course. further development. So what is public? We're in the midst of a, uh, or we have started a phase 2B, or they have started together with us, a phase 2B dose regimen optimization study, which is a placebo-controlled study. There's also additional clinical work going on, and a fully randomized uh, pivotal study is about to start. So, uh, and these, you know, these different studies will all lead to interesting data point because there is not it's not the same as, as developing a traditional pharma product in the orphan space. There is a large unmet medical need. There is nothing. So if, for example, the phase to be data would be very positive, you know, we can always consider how to move this forward at that stage. But but these are the programs that are running. With the um, the other potential therapies that can be used for Duchenne, for the other group of patients that have not been covered by the GSK um, an agreement. Presumably you're taking those forward yourselves at the moment. Yes, we are. We're trying to, you know, do as much as possible and, and, and as much as a company our size can handle. Uh, but the, yeah, we try to move everything in parallel as, as swiftly as possible because there is a, a enormous patient pool, uh, as you can imagine. This being said, we have to be careful. We have to manage expectations as well because although first data have looked very promising, there's still a long you know, way to go. The application of this, this RNA-based therapy to other diseases, um, could you describe where that potential can be? We're working on another way to uh, modulate RNA, and that is to, you know, remove what they call toxic RNA, and that is something that is applicable in the three nucleotide repeat disorders, such as Huntington and myotonic dystrophy, and these are the two other indications we have uh, put on our priority list to, to try to develop, where we have uh, good initial, but still very early and, and preclinical results, and uh, we will also try to advance those. Okay. But, but first priority remains to shan for us. What are your expect, own expectations for the for the company going forward in the next say three to four years? Yeah, I think I think the most important of all, and, and definitely the the biggest wish we all have, is that we are successful in developing something for the Duchenne boys. You know, making a change in their lives would be something with which you know would makes us all very proud and and very happy. So I think, as I said, that remains the the biggest priority. With that, I think we will, you know, be successful in further developing as a standalone company that can have its its place in the uh, in the orphan space and that can make a difference to patients. Luc Dejay, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Hello.